Hi, everybody. This is Justin Antoni Pillay of Wirewheel, and welcome to our webinar today, um, Wirewheel, LiveRamp, and Forrester, uh, presenting what CCPA's Do Not Sell requirement means for you. Um, we're very excited about the uh, presentation today. We've had a tremendous um, amount of feedback and interest in it. Um, so joining me today are uh, Fatima Katablu from um, Forrester and Tim Geenan from LiveRam. And we're gonna be talking about the specific requirements that have really been captured uh, in CCPA around the do not sell requirement, but also framing it in the broader landscape of what is really happening in the privacy world with an eye towards um, understanding the challenges that the marketing teams, the sales teams, and the compliance teams um, are facing in light of CCPA. Uh, so welcome to the webinar. We're excited to have you. And um, I'm gonna briefly introduce my uh, uh, panelists today before we get started. So uh, we're very excited to have Fatima join us from Force today, one of the leading experts in this area uh, and has been writing extensively on the privacy space for a while. So Fatima, welcome to the webinar today. Thanks, Justin. Really pleased to be here. Um, and uh, yes, I am a B2C um, analyst on our B2C marketing research team, and I cover all things privacy, from privacy experience design to consumer sentiment and emotion around privacy and the global data ecosystem. Well, terrific. Fatima, thanks so much for joining us. And um, this is going to be a, a terrific discussion, very timely in terms of what we're hearing of questions in the area around uh, consent, preference management, subject rights, and especially the do not sell requirement. Um, and uh, also joining me today is Tim Geenan from LiveRamp, uh, who uh, has been working in the area of especially consent and preference management for years, speaks extensively on the subject, and uh, has been leading the charge uh, on the LiveRamp side. Um, uh, for quite some time. So, Tim, Tim uh, welcome to the webinar today. Thank you. And do you mind oh. giving a little bit of background on yourself as well, Tim? Yeah, yeah. well, normally you do that for me, so I got unused to it. So, hey, everyone. Uh, very, very cool to be here. My name is Tim Geenan. I've been working in programmatic advertising for over a, a decade. It wasn't called programmatic advertising back then, but I've seen the industry uh, develop and also see it uh, develop into a rather uncontrollable situation where new challenges, uh, sorry, where new solutions are very much desired. And that's what we're aiming for with LiveRam. Uh, and in my spare time, I'm a board member with the IAB. So I get to deal with many different situations with publishers, agencies, uh, advertisers, and they all struggle with the same thing. And uh, we help them navigate uh, to a new solution. Terrific. Well, Tim, welcome to the webinar. And uh, this is Justin Antoni Pillay. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Wirewheel. I uh, have been working in the privacy space uh, as well for years and years, too long to mention. <laughs> and before uh, I started Wirewheel, I served in the Obama administration in a number of roles that covered uh, privacy related issues including on Privacy Shield, GDPR, and uh, a number of different fronts. Um, we've been uh, working in the privacy space um, and helping companies really tackle these problems in a number of different ways. And before we get into um, the substance of our, our discussion today, um, uh, from the Wirewheel side, we provide a full service platform that was really built for both privacy and technical teams. Uh, covering everything from subject rights automation, data inventory and mapping, privacy assessment automation, vendor management, and data discovery and classification. We're going to focus today, um, obviously, on the do not sell requirement and the good work we've been doing really with the live ramp team to bring you an integrated solution to tackle those sets of challenges. Um, and Tim, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the live ramps uh, side of this and, and your focus in the privacy world? Yeah, absolutely. So LiveRam is the leader in identity resolution and data onboarding, and we want to connect people, devices, and data 
across the physical and digital worlds. So we want to break down data silos and want to power exceptional experiences. So what sets us apart? So we have our identity graph, uh, which we use for addressability, like a measurement uh, identity, both for targeting uh, and, and measurement, of course, and for interoperability. Uh, the interoperability, interoperability really plays into the neutrality as we power a lot of the ad tech ecosystem so that uh, uh, brands, publishers, but also SSPs, DSPs can all transact on the same data points. From a privacy perspective, it's quite different. So myself, I originally was one of the founders of Factor. Factor is a company based out of, uh, well, not Factor anymore, but we're based out of Amsterdam. And we were acquired by LifeRamp in April 2019. So what we did with Factor is we built a CMP, a consent management platform, and we went live roughly about a month before GDPR. And I've seen firsthand uh, how new privacy regulations can impact the market. And obviously, I will cover a bit more about that in my later slides, but it's been quite fun so far. I get to speak with a lot of different companies about like what compliance means, and then it turns out compliance means something different to all of them. But it's, it's also from a software perspective. So we help our clients understand the impact of privacy regulation, but we also offer solutions like the consent management platform. No, that's terrific, Tim. And what, one of the things that we at Wirewheel are excited about this joint partnership and joint offering with LiveRamp is that together we've been thinking about solving not only the privacy related challenges under GDPR, CCPA, and all the state laws that are likely to come, but there's been a real focus on the customer experience, the view and the challenges that our marketing and sales teams for our customers face. And while we're not gonna cover it in depth today, except at the end, um, you can see at the bottom of our slides, we have a link to uh, a site that if the listeners wanna see exactly what we're doing here on the Wirewheel Live Ramp solution for, for Do Not Sell, you can sign up at wirewheel.io backslash DNS webinar uh, to get a demo from our joint teams. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Fatima to, uh, to start our discussion. Thanks, Justin. So again, as I mentioned, I sit in the B2C marketing world at Forrester, and um, I love this cartoon because this is basically how most marketers see the world today, right? We don't think about purpose, we don't think about use limitations, and we think of the uh, data that we're collecting as some sort of an asset, we'll stick it off in a database somewhere, and we'll figure out a use for it later, it might be useful later. The problem is that our customers don't really know that this is how we function. Um, of course, many of them know that you're collecting you know, in-store and online transactions and connecting that together. Uh, they may know that you know, you're know, you retargeting them when they've left something in the shopping cart, um, but they don't understand the scope and the scale of data collection. And in fact, when we think about how data is collected today, um, it's really about, it's really gotten very pushy. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see that you know, this is a, a fairly typical way that you get your first introduction to a website when you're doing a search, right? You, you do the Google search or you do whatever search and you click on the link and there you go to the website and the first thing they want is an email from you. Now, I don't even know if I want to be on the website yet. And this particular retailer is even saying, no thanks, I prefer to pay full price. Well, I'd sort of like to figure out if I actually want anything from your website yet. But this is the nature of marketing today. We just want all of the data from people all the time. The issue with that is that we've gotten very, very good at connecting all of those disparate pieces of data and actually connecting them to devices and to people. And this is really starting to creep customers out because when we actually do collect that information and connect it to a device or an experience in a way that the customer didn't reasonably expect us to do, they get freaked out. They tell us that they're not into this form of behavioral advertising. And this is really the challenge that we face today. So what has the result of all of this been? 
Well, the tactics that marketers are using every single day in order to run their businesses are scorned. Um, 66% of customers, over a third of U.S. online adults, tell us that they're com uncomfortable with brands selling and sharing their personal information. Nearly the same number say it's not okay for, for retailers to track their location to send offers based on where they've been or what they've looked at. And 65% think it's wrong for us to track them across devices. So imagine that. We think we're doing a great thing by connecting your, your desktop browsing to your mobile phone browsing so that we can be more personal, so that we can make sure to remind you of that product that you left in your shopping basket. They don't see it as a service. They see it as a violation. We live in what we call a privacy personalization paradox. Nearly a quarter of people in the U.S. tell us that they would be more likely to read an email if the content is personalized to them. But 60% aren't willing to share more information with us in order to make that happen. Now, what is the, the crux of some of this? Well, our current state is that privacy is still functionally and fundamentally a job for legal and compliance teams. Marketing has not gotten involved here. And that is a problem because some publishers, after GDPR went live, said, well, we actually just don't think we can comply with this law, so we're going to actually black out our sites to anybody coming from a European IP address. Why? Because the site owners didn't think that they could actually do a, a GDPR compliant version of their websites. They couldn't manage their cookies and trackers and so on. And that is a problem from a revenue perspective, from a site and brand perspective, and so on. Likewise, we are, we are running up against real problems with CCPA with respect to cookie banners, with respect to how our data is being collected and sold. And these privacy rights are really um, kind of coming to the, to the foreground via, pri via privacy and at legal and compliance teams as opposed to brand teams, as opposed to customer experience teams, which is where it really should be. Now, Justin's got us on, on this mobile cookie page, which is great, because really, even my own company is sort of guilty of falling down this compliance trap. Cookie banners have this setup of you must tell us what you want and you must you know, accept our cookies all the time. So when customers tell us they don't like this or they start bypassing these things, we make the banners bigger. We make them more deceptive. We start to deploy dark patterns where we make it really hard for a customer to understand what they're actually opting into or out of. And again, this is not a good customer experience. When we ask marketers and customer experience teams to explain to us why their cookie banners take up two thirds of the page when you click in for the first moment, or why their privacy pages are jargon filled and full of legalese and incredibly hard to, to parse, well, compliance told me I have to show it this way, or legal told me, legal gave it to me that way, and that's how I deploy it. What all of these user experiences and teams forget is that privacy is functionally a relationship building step. It is about trust. Think of this as a first date. Think of all of these privacy experiences that I've just shown you as a first date. What happens is I go on a first date and maybe you ask me a couple of questions about how, how I like my latte or, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself, but you're not asking somebody to tell you what their finances look like and how many children they want to have on a first date. That's ridiculous. But when we start to build privacy experiences in the way that I've shown you, that's what we're doing. We're asking customers to give us their information, to opt into cookies, to opt into all kinds of data collection before they've actually understood what they're giving away. So our hypothesis is that it is time for us to converge consent management with preference management and start to treat these experiences like the customer experiences, like the brand touch points that they are. And that means beginning to involve marketing, branding, customer experience, and user experience in the conversation.
I'm going to give you just a couple of examples of where we see this happening, and then I'll turn things back over to Justin. Lufthansa is a brand I point to often because look at how clear and human understandable their cookie settings are. They show you the statistics and comfort and personalization cookies, and then in one click you can drop down and see exactly what each of those is. Now pay attention to the word comfort here because this is really about making your site experience better for the customer. It's intuitive, and it uses language that the customer can understand to describe the experience. This is a cookie banner I really like. Now, Yelp starts to use um, consent-like devices to start to capture simple preferences about the profile. So that experience is a great one because it's an easy yes or no question as to the kind of, of um, um, uh, experiences I'd like to see. And <clears throat> excuse me, not this is not Yelp, this is OpenTable. Um, basically asking, do I eat here often? And that's great, but it's a very simple interface, not dissimilar to a cookie consent banner. Home Chef starts to ask me questions about the information that they need to tailor their, their service to me. And what I love here is, again, it's very simple, very intuitive, lets me update my choices in a progressive way, and it doesn't feel like I'm going through 52 questions. They're asking me these questions in real time, in context, for the experience that they're serving up to me. And they're giving me real value for answering these questions because, hey, my recipes and my um, purchase uh, recommendations get better. Now, Sephora has done a great thing here. And, and when I think about Sephora, they've really connected buying makeup and skincare, which is a really personal experience across all of their channels. So even in a chat bot, which is the upper right hand graphic here, they are asking questions that are simple, to the point, just like a cookie consent banner would do. And they're connecting that to my entire CRM record so that they can make recommendations on the basis of the answers that I've given them. They do this in store, they do this online, they do this in their chat bot, and they do this in their mobile app. Again, a very simple and straightforward interface for collecting my profile preferences, my concerns, and my product preferences, and they use this, and they really bring value to the entire um, uh, relationship with, with these tools. The last example I want to give you is another retailer, and this one really goes to the point of the convergence of consent and preference. Home Depot does a really great thing by saying, okay, tell us about the kinds of content that you want. So in that top widget, you'll see what are my interests? Well, in my case, it happens to be gardening. And it's not enough to say just gardening because there are landscape gardeners. There are fruit gardeners in the summer. There are people who really like doing trees and orchards. And they start to ask me in very simple widget format, what my preferences with respect to gardening are. And then they ask whether I'm a beginner, intermediate, or expert gardener. Then we go into the consent side of this. And this is where I opt in to receive different communications. Now the convergence point here is when I start to opt into emails, when I start to opt into SMS, and wouldn't it be great if they gave me the opportunity to to opt in to behavioral tracking right there too. I can opt in for them to use cookies to show me ads that are relevant to my interests across multiple publisher sites. This is what we mean when we say that preference and consent really need to converge. Now, in order to get this right, we do need to have three different things because customers have to trust us and there has to be a value exchange for them. What do we mean by this? Well, the first thing is transparency. You have to explain clearly the data that you're collecting and how you're going to use it. In that Home Depot example that I just showed you, I can click on a little button and see exactly what a personalized email will look like. And that is both transparent and human understandable. We need to make our privacy experiences really human understandable, and we need to be responsive when our customers ask us questions. So again, under CCPA, as Justin mentioned, 
consumers have new rights. And when they come in and they ask for that information about themselves, or they want to know how you're using their personal information, we need to be able to tell them. The second pillar here is about meaningful choice. This is not a my way or the highway kind of setup. We have to actually go to this place of progressive data collection. We have to be able to allow data minimization, so allowing a customer to say, I'm not quite ready to give you location access in your, in your mobile app yet, without breaking the customer experience. And we've got to give consumers the option to opt down when they're giving us consent versus just opting out. This nuclear option isn't good for anyone. And finally, we have to uh, display a fair value exchange and commit to that fair value exchange. What does that mean? Well, first of all, customers have to believe that the information that they're sharing with you, the consent that they're giving you, actually is delivering value for them. And you, as a marketer, as a business, have to recognize that value has different meanings for different people. You may have some customers that are very, very privacy conscious and sensitive. Those customers need to have a different level of value for the data that they're sharing. Finally, you have to pass the reasonable expectation test with every new use of data. CCPA tells us that if the purpose of the, the data that you're collecting and the use of the data that you're collecting is materially different to the purpose that you initially collected it for, you've got to tell customers. It's not enough to just update your privacy policy. You have to get consent for that new purpose of data. Customers won't consent if the use of the data isn't reasonable. So as you're designing your purpose, as you're designing your new data um, um, use cases, make sure that you're passing the sniff test, not just with other marketers, not just with people inside your organizations, but with an average consumer. And these are the kinds of, of things that you can do to make sure that when we see this convergence of consent and preference really come to light, your customers will be willing to opt in and share this incredibly valuable preference data with you. And with that. Fatima, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, that was a terrific summary. And the thing that, you know, really catches my ear as you're talking, Fatima, is how much you're seeing a trend uh, and movement, including with companies, of uh, bringing the marketing and sales teams to start at least co-owning the experience around consent and preference management so that companies are starting to not only view this as a compliance exercise, but something that starts to build trust and is incrementally a better user experience. Yeah, we're right? we right? absolutely seeing that. And, and frankly, you know, everybody kind of ran towards CCPA and GDPR from a compliance perspective, and that's understandable. Uh, that was a long runway and a lot of hard work. But what we see now is you've got branding experts inside the organization looking at some of the privacy experiences and thinking, wait a minute, this isn't on brand for us. Or people, you know, testing the website and realizing that you're seeing a cookie banner that takes up two thirds of the page. Well, we've put a lot of work into creating that landing page and the customer's not even seeing our work. What should we be thinking about? Maybe we um, let the customer scroll three times before we show that cookie banner. Maybe we start to think about a more streamlined cookie experience. Um, so absolutely, we're beginning to see that, and it's, it's really heartening. Um, obviously, you can imagine we're seeing it more from B2C brands right now um, and, and direct-to-consumer brands, but you know, the, the writing is on the wall. We are going to, um, to see consent um, land and turn into an actual customer touch point, which it, for most companies it really isn't today. That's, uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and Fatima, I'm sure we're going to get uh, a fair number of questions coming in too. So we're going to come back to uh, the whole panel here in a minute. But it's a perfect transition point because uh, what we want to talk about next is to really understand CCPA's do not sell requirement um, 
when all of us are coming to it from a prior experience of having seen cookies, cookie banners, and cookie and preference management over the last five, six, seven years. And, and a little bit is orienting all of our users about where we are and where we're going with this. Um, because what we've really seen as companies are tackling um, these challenges is overall privacy has historically been just a compliance challenge, as you say, Fatima, and as Tim talks about all the time. And it has become a much more significant data management um, and marketing challenge along the way. And that means many more parts of the organization are involved day to day, and many more parts of an organization are, um, are involved in the conversation because Privacy is critical to telling your story. Privacy is critical to start building trust with your customers. And I think uh, one of the key things we have seen over and over is that when we go talk to marketing sales teams and we say, is trust critical to you from a brand perspective? The, the answer is almost always yes. And we say then, well, how important is the treatment of data and treatment of personal information in building trust with your customers? And almost every brand views that as something important. And yet when you take them to their privacy page or you go to their website and you type in the word privacy, many of the big brands that we go to still have sites that look like they were created at the dawn of the internet. You know, they, they're very legally very compliance driven. And we're seeing this movement towards telling your story around trust and privacy in smaller bites, more understandable, and in an experience that people actually like. Uh, so I couldn't agree with you more, but in that context, I'm gonna shift for a moment to see how is uh, how are the developments of CCPA uh, aligned very much with what Fatima was talking about. So let's start with the the base law. We're obviously in a very challenged environment right now if you're part of the team at your company that's handling uh, CCPA. I, I almost feel uh, like if you're in the seat where Tim, me, and Fatima sit, uh, you want to put your arm around your colleague's shoulders because you're dealing with a situation where privacy marketing teams are having to handle implementation of a law when the law has been passed, it has a lot of terms in it that are very significant. And the regulations that are implementing that law are still being issued right now. That's just a tough situation for us. And what we're seeing, Tim and Fatima, almost week to week is that a lot of the burden of taking care of compliance under CCPA really does fall to marketing teams and sales teams both in terms of being able to say and meet the disclosure requirements under CCPI and to be able to handle a do not sell request. And, uh, in, and when the time comes to actually collect data and return it back to a customer, a lot of the data that companies have to worry about sits in a marketing organization. So those marketing teams are really being hit from multiple sides. Um, just by way of framing, obviously, one of the major focuses of CCPA was really around the sale of data. And whether if you look at the laws originally written, which I'll talk about um, now, or if you talk about the regulations as they're developing, there's a lot of focus and almost in a very prescriptive way about giving enough information to a consumer or to a person at the end of the line that their data will or may be sold. Um, when you talk about opt out of the sale of data, that ends up being very closely aligned with the other rights in CCPA around notification and around subject access. In other words, enabling a consumer who's covered by the act to get access to their data and delete their data in the same user experience that covers opt out of the sale of data. And that's important. Um, you'll see company after company that's really thinking about that entire customer experience so that it's not broken up in a way that makes a consumer to go to multiple places. And we see company after company starting to tell that affirmative story around trust in the same place that they're handling 
opt out of the sale of data, consent and preference management, and access and deletion, because you want there to be a very clear story of how you handle that. Um, obviously, there's a lot of convergence with other laws going on at, in parallel. Not 100% convergence, but there are a lot of overlaps. Um, and that does bring some benefits to it. Um, but I will say, you know, one of the things we've seen is just some of the challenges around, um, around the issuance of regulations. Um, so I, I, although, uh, you know, this, this is a very complex regulatory environment, I'll just cover, you know, just a week ago, <clears throat> the Attorney General's Office issued a modified version of these draft regulations. And it included some particular uh, revisions that apply even just to the sale of data. And remember, for those listening, the final versions of those regulations are likely to be issued sometime between March and July. And the, and the Attorney General is going to be, be um, starting to enforce under the law and the regulations starting in July. Um, unless there's some extension, which we, you know, we really haven't heard about yet. Um, but an example of how these are being evolved is if you look at the draft regulations, the Attorney General's Office actually published an image of a proposed uh, button for do not sell my personal information or do not sell my data. Now, all of us know that a government dictating or, you know, sort of proposing a user experience can be quite broad. So it's not meant to be, you know, the only way to do it. But you can tell that even from the regulatory perspective, simplification and making it really easy for consumers to be able to uh, register a do not sell request has been very important to the Attorney General's office. And when it comes to providing information around the sale of data and giving consumers an idea of how to exercise their right, the uh, Attorney General's Office is spending a lot of time laying out principles that are very much tied to the things Fatima covered earlier. And so that brings me to what, what really is the ideal solution that brings together um, an ability to tackle the requirements under CCPA, be able to handle a do not sell request, and starts to also tell the story around trust and, uh, and privacy at the same time. So the, four, the five things that we really have focused on in terms of the ideal solution are the following. The first is in the same user experience in which you enable an opt-out request and in which you enable an access or deletion request under CCPA, think about something that actually gives all of the information that you're required to give under CCPA around their rights, around consumers' notice on the sale of data, around the, the um, categories of data you're collecting, Give it to them in the same user experience and think about telling that story in a way that really starts to build your brand. Um, second, that consumer experience should not only encompass do not sell, but think about making sure you're able to enable your, your, your consumers to manage consent, manage preference, register a do not sell request, and register an access deletion request in the same thing. You don't want to compartmentalize that experience. You want to make it something that starts to tell a story. Third, you want to be able to not only uh, collect those consent and preference uh, requirements from your customers and, and, and signal. The do not sell request fundamentally is about exposing and collecting that information and storing it in something that's effectively what's being referred to in the industry as a suppression list. In other words, for compliance purposes and otherwise, when you get that do not sell request, you have to put it somewhere. And you wanna put it somewhere that will be accessible to the compliance team and the data teams and be able to be used in multiple different ways. And remember that very closely aligned with the do not sell request is the ability to actually um, 
fulfill a subject rights request. And in the, in the user experience world, we've been really productizing this around trust centers that are powered by Wirewheel and LiveRamp that allow consumers to have small, really understandable bits of information in a way that you can walk through it in a, in a user experience that makes sense and that's templatized. Um, that you're not only informing the consumers of their rights, you're managing the consent and preferences, that you're collecting the do not sell requests, that you're recording them in a usable suppression list, and that you also have the ability to fulfill subject access requests, which of course carry with it a lot more requirements around authentication, ticketing, management of the collection of data, and then encryption and delivery back to the customer. And that's the overall user experience that starts to tell a story that you're not only compliant, but you're thinking about the human beings at the end of the line and making it really easy for them to start to trust you. And with that, I really wanted to turn it over to Tim to talk more specifically about the consent preference management uh, uh, side of this equation. Yeah, thanks, Justin. I think the slide is missing some details. Yeah, there we go. So look, I, first of all, I, I, I like all the examples given by Fatima, and then I'm, I'm listening to the Home Chef example, and I'm thinking like, yeah, that actually really, really looks nice. And then I'm thinking, why can it not always be like that? And then I go to their website, and then I look at how many cookies do I get, and do they ask permission? Like, so first of all, there's no permission and I get 63 different cookies. So while I hear you guys talking, I do some research and I figured out like, it's very easy to manage privacy when it's just related to the domain or just related to that specific service. But if you look at the open web and like how the internet interoperates and the vendors that Home Chef requires to do their, uh, to do their work, it, it actually becomes a lot more complicated. So <laughs> if you look at CCPA, you have the right to notice. Uh, and that right to notice needs to be stated in the CCPA. And you have the right to opt out, which is basically an embedded do not sell function, which I will show you later. On the GDPR side, actually, it's an explicit opt in, explicit consent. And I like the examples about the American media companies that basically shut off access to their European users. But if you look at the consent opt-in rates that we see in Europe, it's, it's pretty uh, staggering, actually. Like, it, it was very surprising to us that the amount of people who opt in, and it's also not necessarily because of dark patterns, but the way that people care, is like plus 90%. And these are very important learning points to us, but most people, they don't want to read these long uh, uh, privacy notices. They're looking for the path to least resistance. Like I have a 13 year old daughter and uh, like when I look over her shoulder and I see her on her phone, like the way she toggles through everything, she doesn't really dig into anything. Like she just wants to go to the content that she's looking for. Um, purposes for processing on the GDPR side. Like that's something that also in CD CCPA is a thing, but it was very much more specific under GDPR. Like you have to uh, like think back about the Lufthansa example. You have to look at the purposes that data collection is for. Well, if you look at Lufthansa, like the comfort option is actually really cool. But if you start looking at what that does, in some cases, I'm not saying it's the Lufthansa example as well. Like this actually includes sharing with third parties. So is it really that comfortable yet? So there's a trade-off here between what what you create for a consumer and make it understandable for them and what is compliant. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So if you're gonna select a consent and preference management platform, there's a few questions that you can ask yourself. First one is, is it compliant? And that question is actually more complicated than it seems because compliance is very much in the eye of the beholder. Before we went live, we thought we had a perfect uh, product. We thought we have a perfectly designed, everything worked. And then as soon as we started integrating, clients were like, yeah, but we want this. We want to have that button there. This button should say uh, X or it should say Y. Or there's a little close button here in the upper right corner. Can we remove that? That will increase our uh, opt-in rates. 
compliance is, is still very much a discussion. And what I've learned so far is that compliance, uh, yes, that sits with the legal and the compliance team, uh, but they haven't really worked together with any other teams within the same company. So when it comes to selecting a consent and reference managed platform, like if you're surrounded by six or seven colleagues from different departments, uh, by now I consider that to be a very normal situation. The second one is, is it auditable? So uh, very simple, once I click on a button, does that get registered? If I click on a DNS uh, uh, button and I toggle that on, is that action being recorded? What if an authority ever knocks on your door as a company and says, hey, can you prove that this person opted out to the sale of their personal data or didn't opt out? So that's an important requirement. Easy to use, can I make changes on the fly? I think as you, as you have your first implementation live of the product, you're gonna learn that some things work better than others, or you're gonna get consumer feedback, like, hey, this is not very clear. Like, it's very important that you can make changes on the fly and that you have version control because as soon as you change your notice, uh, that means you're going to have to reframe either your consent or your opt out question. So keep that in mind. Well, next point interpreted uh, compliance uh, my way. Again, that uh, really feeds back to the first point. Uh, you're going to learn and you're going to change as you go. It's imp very important that the platform that you choose uh, allows you to do that and then customize it. What I very much like is when clients actually customize the CMP and make it fit their own brand experience. Like from a live run perspective, we've worked a lot on the customization and we see the best results if people, if companies actually style the CMP exactly in the way of the rest of the experience of the website or the app. Next slide, please. So, Key CCPA features, obviously customization. So given that CCPA is, is still pretty unclear, like, uh, like Justin said, uh, I think the comments actually closed in March and I saw an update to the Rex last week. I think customization is absolutely key because there's gonna be uh, updates and you're gonna have to deal with that. So make sure that what you do right now isn't your def uh, definite solution. Then the interoperability aspect, and this is very much, uh, very often overlooked. Choices that consumers make, whether that's an opt-out or an opt-in, have to translate into the rest of the technology of the app. I'm gonna take uh, Home Chef as an example. I did not give consent, but let's assume I did, or I gave a partial consent, or uh, I gave an opt-out for a very specific purpose. That means under CA, only for I cannot load in the tagging and the pixels that are related to that purpose of vendors. Very often you see, let's say, cookie banners or, or DNS uh, buttons that don't really do anything. And it's very important uh, that you have the events uh, connected from the CMP onto your tag manager and onto the rest uh, of, of any downstream technology that might load. What we did differently, we built a container. It's a special tag that uh, auto detects the geographic location of the user. So we know whether a person is in California or in Europe, and we serve the appropriate notices and the appropriate configuration. Signals to communicate DNS. Um, so any data request will include a string communicated to all, all parties. So this is a piece of code that's uh, readable by vendors on the page, so whether they know whether they have an opt-out or an opt-in, or whether nothing is there. They can base a conclusion on that as well. You can uh, optionally configure an opt-out pixel, so if I say do not sell data and I involve LiveRam in that, we will actually receive the opt-out pixel and know for this user can no longer do not uh, sell personal data. Uh, and back to the interoperability, the conditional firing set up to stop third parties from data skills is very tedious, but very, very important to manage. I'll explain this one more time. Like, if I go to any website in particular, you're gonna see anywhere between 30 and 60 different third parties involved. You want to exactly manage how these third parties behave on your page, and you do that based on the content or on the DNS request. 
uh, and then on a user identification level so uh, for example this is, has to do with the age but you could show a different uh, scenario of this CMP uh, under certain uh, rules uh, the same will happen when it's uh, about federal uh, when federal laws uh, will start happening you can have rules in place for every different state or for every different exception next slide and Tim you know one, one thing to just um, I'd add to that briefly is um, everything you've said makes eminent sense, especially because you need to be able to take that do not sell, configure it, and it has to be very flexible, especially in light of the fact that the CCPA guidance um, is still evolving, and it's only two months or so until enforcement begins, three or four months here. So um, the other question we get and we have received even today is, well, you know, when you talk about a suppression list, what does that mean and why? And this is something we, you and I have, have, and I'm sure Fatima get all the time. And I thought I'd just talk about that briefly. Uh, not only, uh, the analogy I've used in the past is there's a episode of Seinfeld that I remember from the 90s that I just love, in which uh, Jerry Seinfeld goes to rent a car and he made a reservation and he goes up to the desk and he says, goes to get his car and they say, no, we've given the car away. And uh, Seinfeld says, well, look, anybody can take a reservation. The key is you have to hold the reservation, right? And so a lot of what we're talking about is we want to have a really clear user experience that tells the story that actually enables your consumers to build trust and then, you know, to actually take that reservation, to actually take a do not sell request. Um, the reason we talked about a suppression list is because that's where you hold the reservation. And there are very specific things under CCPA that will depend on you having that suppression list. An example of that is even if somebody does a do not sell request, you can still as a company serve a first party ad to that party, but there are situations depending on where the regulations come out where you might not be able to share that personal information with a third party if it's for advertising purposes. So the storing and the you know holding of a uh, of that opt out request in an infrastructure that complies with CCPA and enables your teams from a marketing sales and a customer perspective to actually use their data to accomplish your mission to serve first party ads to be able to not share it with third parties depends on that suppression list and the ability to use it and the integrated approach that we bring to bear kind of takes care of not only those key upfront features, but the ability to actually have a suppression list you can use. Um, back to you, Tim. Yeah, I fully uh, agree with that. And I think if you look at CCPA and you start drilling down, I think you can identify eight to 10 different purposes. And that goes from measuring fraud to security, to uh, advertising, to measurement. And it's very important that all these different uh, purposes have different rules and different suppressions uh, uh, linked against it. Uh, I also see a few questions in, in the Q&A section uh, of the webinar, so I'm going to take one out. There's a question here that if a company is fully compliant with GDPR, what are the critical points to be compliant with CCPA? So fully compliant with GDPR is, is not something I've seen very often. So uh, but your question is, 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 very, uh, is very fair. I do think that you've done, if you have done a lot of the GDPR work already, you're gonna find CCPA easier. Uh, sorry for the person <laughs> flipping the slides, please back, back, back. I'm just <laughs> handling the Q&A questions. <laughs> yeah, and back one more time. Yeah, and we may end up with just one more. We have only a few minutes here, Tim. So, um, okay. Why don't you did you uh, did you end up answering that question? Because we may need to no, skip not, ahead just a minute or so. Yeah, but I think the key component here: GDPR is opt-in, where CCPA is opt-out. And I think for both, it's critically important that you review your vendors and that you make an audit, like you make an analysis of what's currently happening on your websites and apps. So I'm going to skip the audit ID parts for time purposes. So if you go to the next slide, um, yeah, this is like, I, I always see this, like put a do not sell button or link on the website and then everything magically will be uh, done. 
and this is the point that I really also took from Fatima's presentation. It's like there's a there's a trade-off here between what's good for consumers and understandable for consumers versus what actually needs to be done at the enterprise level. And it really, it is not as simple as putting a button on there. There's a lot of steps that need to happen. And given that these steps haven't been taken in the last five to 10 years or so, uh, I think a lot of enterprises right now that, okay, the way we've been doing wasn't that great so far. And they're, like we're discovering vendors that they put on the website eight years ago and that they're just no longer active. Um, it, it, it's actually an invitation to set up a lot more processes and do a lot more thinking on like how does privacy by default or by design would look like. Um, there's a report here in the Brussels Times that says 90% of the website does not complain. I have another report that says uh, only 8% of the websites in California have something like a do not sell. And uh, the majority of that is also not set up properly. So you can, just like with GDPR, uh, a few months in, and you can see that not a lot has happened uh, yet. Um, this slide speaks to the customization options of the do not sell button. Like I think everyone who wants to really learn more about that, feel free to reach out to uh, Wirewheel or myself directly. And I just want yeah, to- Yeah, that, that brings us to the joint solution we have here where, and we've had some questions about this, Tim, too. You know, first of all, um, you know, this was focused really on do not sell, but our integrated solution does handle everything from consent and preference management on the LiveRamp platform through the taking of a do not sell request and the creation of a suppression list on a LiveRamp and Wirewheel to the handling of a full access or deletion request uh, in both you know, um, automated workflows or fully integrated into backend systems. Uh, we obviously aren't going to be able to cover all of that today, but a number of requests have come through for more information just on the do not, on the access and deletion requirements. And our teams will share with you other webinars in which uh, Tim and myself have covered those uh, subjects at length. So we're happy to share that uh, in terms of additional uh, information. And the joint live ramp and wire wheel solution, as, I, as uh, Tim mentioned, really can be um, demoed uh, at any time by going to the link at the bottom of the, the webinar site, uh, wirewheel.io slash DNS dash webinar, and we're happy to uh, demonstrate uh, the whole uh, solution. Um, we had one more um, you know, question that came through, which is when you're handling the incoming subject access request, in the joint solution, is it manual or do they actually process, take in the request and respond? And the software platform uh, joint solution does in fact do the automated ticketing and you can onboard backend systems uh, via API to actually automate that process over time as well. So it is a, a, a quite a scalable solution that, that we can bring to bear that maps to a lot of the front end requirements that we've been talking about. Um, we have a lot of questions that have come through around what does it mean if you're not actually, quote, selling information? And um, Tim um, and Fatima, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer briefly, but I would love to get a view from you as well. Both, you know, from my perspective, under the law and the regulations, I would really be careful about saying you never, quote, sell information under CCPA because sell is so broadly defined. Uh, and we and so um, what we see and what we've been encouraging folks is have flexible language that says we don't technically sell your data in the way you might think of it, but uh, because sale is so broadly defined, there may be ways in which some action we're taking is actually covered by the sale requirement. Yeah, and, and then you know, at, go yeah, go ahead for of course. Oh, sorry, I, I just want to say like sell is actually very broadly defined and basically includes any transfer of personal data for commercial purposes. Exactly, and and that's that's why a lot of companies who don't sell data in the way one might use it in the you know ordinary nor ordinary course of talking about it are actually setting up CCPA compliance regimes under do not sell anyway. Um, if you actually are confident you don't sell data, even within the meaning of the term, you don't have to put up a do not sell uh, button, but it, it's, it, we've been having trouble finding companies that that's, that's the case. Fatima, do you have other, other thoughts on this one? 
Um, like you, uh, I think that very few companies um, should be posting. Do not, uh, we, you know, we we don't sell our data. I actually have a um, a, a library I've been building of uh, CCPA implementations, and um, I, I've seen a number of businesses say, "Look." You know, the, the definition of this is still pretty nebulous. Um, we're not giving you a do not sell uh, button yet um, uh, until we have more clarity. Um, I think you can hedge your bets with that, but I think it, it, it's actually, again, from a branding experience, um, do you want to be that company? Um, and, and I would say the same is true of companies too, and I think we got a question about this. Um, if you aren't, if you know, you're, not all of your customers are going to be Californian, you may not be headquartered in California. So I get a lot of questions from clients saying, well, you know, should we be doing this as a universal set of rights for all of our customers or should we be doing this uh, just for our, our California customers? And my position on that is, is generally and broadly, do you want to be the company that says, hey, my California customers have the right to opt out or to, to see what information I've collected about them. But because you live in Illinois or because you live in, in New York, um, I'm not going to give you those same rights. Um, the optics of that are bad enough that I would say um, you, you really want to make CCPA your, your baseline set of rights for, for customers. And so I think uh, one question from... from like, would you say it would echo more CCPA or more GDPR? Like, if you want to have a privacy strategy that's trust and consumer oriented, which one would you lean towards then? Well, I, I really do think that it, it is geographic, right, Tim? I, I think um, the CCPA um, addresses concerns that, that I think Americans have in a different way than uh, the, the GDPR. Do I think that, you know, consent and, and um, cookie consent is really important? I do, but do I think that it's being implemented particularly well in most of Europe? I don't. Um, so I'm, I'm holding... Um, my judgment to say, uh, let's see how people really start to enforce CCPA and um, and whether consumers really feel like um, they they do have more rights um, the way that, that this is this is created. But I think that broadly speaking, um, the U.S. is always going to be an opt out um, model versus an opt in model. I have a hard time seeing that opt in is the way to go for for U.S. markets. Thank you. No, I, I, I agree with you, Fatima, and that was, as usual, very thoughtful. And we have a ton of other questions that are coming in, but uh, we're coming towards the end of our hour. So our teams will uh, follow up with folks who have actually uh, submitted questions to either get you the answers or we have other webinars we can point you to. Um, obviously, for more information, you can see, uh, reach out to us on the link at the bottom of the page. Um, and, um, you know, the, the exciting thing is when you listen to Fatima and you really see where the companies that are moving forward on this basis are thinking about customer experience, when you see how the landscape is changing to bring these kinds of issues, not only from a compliance perspective, but a marketing perspective and a uh, consumer experience perspective, I, I think it's an exciting thing and a really good movement overall. Uh, and will be important just from a human rights perspective. And Fatima, you talk about this all the time. Uh, I, I do feel for a lot of companies having to tackle these challenges when you know we have we have customers who spent an incredible amount trying to get up to speed and get versions of the, their compliance sites up based on the first draft of the regulations, only to see so much change uh, you know in these months. And our teams here can help you tackle those in a flexible environment. It is a challenge though for companies right now and, and we're empathetic to that. Um, so uh, Fatima, Tim, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate thank it. I thought it was a fun. phenomenal discussion. Yeah, to you both. It was great to be with you guys. Thank you, Justin. Thanks yep. for doing Us too. Look forward to the next one and uh, thanks again for joining.